Welcome back to Echo Ridge and another episode in our Maximum Difficulty Achievement Run. Today, we're going to be building some rockets. The issue that was presented to me when I started playing today was the fact that we only had, well at this time, 335 kilos worth of steel. And this isn't counting the fact that I need to complete all the bunker tiles down this side, and all the rocket components are going to be made out of steel as well. Speaking of which, after this little side to our nuclear sauna, every top surface of the planetoid is going to be bunker tiles, save for this little strip right here, which we need visibility through for both the enclosed telescope and the mission control station. So at least here on Tuxedo, we won't have to worry about meteors anymore. Over on Rikazan, we're getting there. We've managed to replace all of the mistakenly placed steel tiles for bunker tiles. And as more lime comes in, more steel is created. Also on Rikazan, we're taking the opportunity to start gutting out this biome like I had previously said, four tiles of height at a time. And then we're going to take a bunch of these ores and send them back to the home planetoid as well. Over on Rikazan, the only duplicate left is Mr. DK Oz, who is doing one final sweep to make sure all the materials in and around the planetoid are sitting in between these two automatic dispensers. We've already marked the conveyor loader to pick up everything. So the auto sweeper is literally doing that. It's going to take a pretty long time because there's a planetoid worth of materials sitting in that one tile. But you'll notice, even in this short minute or two, we're already up to 715 kilos worth of steel. And for a while, I couldn't figure it out because, well, we're sitting at over 10 tons of iron on the planetoid, thanks to the wonderful contributions of Rikazan. Well, come to find out, for some reason, my rock crusher was disabled. And even though they are pounding through it, we still have two tons worth of eggshell, 800 kilos worth of small poke shell molts and a ton and a half of standard size poke shell molts. So lime's not going to be an issue here in a little while. Some other modifications I've been making over on Toxedo were the addition of three more ethanol distilleries. And that was for the simple reason that we were running out of carbon dioxide and well, power is actually starting to be an issue to the point where we've actually used up all of our spare hydrogen the coal generators are going, and what's more impressive about that is they're all sitting in a power control station, and yet we still can't keep up with the demand on power. The four ethanol distilleries are exactly what it takes to be able to provide the petroleum generator exactly two kilos worth of ethanol per second, which is the most that one petroleum generator can use. In fact, this one buffer tank is actually starting to get a little bit of backlog of ethanol. I made sure the duplicates can't get down here. This is, if you remember, the excess poke shell storage from these poke shells who are being groomed. The great thing about these extra poke shells is they're going to go a long way into creating more lime. Now, the reason we're starting to run out on power is because, well, we added another complete electrolyzer that runs pretty much constantly. We have a couple of extra thermal aqua tuners for both the liquid oxygen and the liquid hydrogen. The metal refineries are starting to work a lot more because of the recently found surplus of lime, not to mention that I queued up even more super coolant. So depending on how much each of those systems are running, it dictates how we're doing on power. But as you can see, just a minute later, we're doing just fine. But we need to head off this problem before it becomes a bigger issue. So it looks like it's finally time for us to get into some geothermal power. And I'm thinking this spot right here is really nice because of the obsidian, we'll be able to bore through it. I would have preferred something more centrally located to ensure that our heat spike had access to a lot more magma before we start draining all the heat out of it. Now I'm going to try to design a system in this area here to be able to siphon all that heat out. And I'm sad to say I'm not going to do the typical echo maneuver and just YOLO it, which would be just start boring through it and then build everything out. I'm going to play it a little safer and actually vacuum this area. But I want to design a system that I can actually still get into and that way I can continue that heat spike in the future, which I believe is going to end up calling for some sort of liquid locks. And in that case, I don't want to use this expensive super coolant, so we're just going to make some Nor Nafta. Go to our temperature shift plate. We only have 600 tons worth of plastic and just put several of these down. And then as they heat up, I'll make sure that I sit here with the camera right here so that I can make it in time to be able to mop it just like that. And the naft is actually going to be the key to this system. This chamber here is going to be filled with nothing but hot steam. And we're going to have some door system here that controls how much heat is going to be allowed in the chamber. 
This double liquid lock actually serves two purposes though. One, making sure this steam heat here doesn't end up escaping out here, but it's also gonna give us a point that's gonna remain a vacuum so we'll be able to burrow down and make our way over to this part of the obsidian and build our system. With our naphtha locks complete, we can start burrowing into the core of this planetoid very, very carefully. I'm gonna leave this steel gas pump in here just in the off chance that something happens bad and this area no longer becomes a vacuum, hoping that the gas pump will be able to take whatever gas we accidentally created and bring it out of the chamber. Otherwise, it would become superheated really quick and bad things would happen. Now, in the interest of keeping at least two layers of abyssalite, that way it's an effective thermal barrier, I'm going to bore down here, at least to start off with. We're going to use some obsidian ladders because obsidian can withstand the heat, hence the fact these obsidian tiles are just relaxing down here. And as soon as these two gas pumps finish vacuuming out this area, we'll get to the business of building the heat spike out of beautiful diamond window tiles. Unfortunately, it looks like by digging this up, some of the magma has risen. So we're gonna have to do a little bit of trimming here to get that magma level to go back down. We don't want poor Carol have to sit in magma because unlike the obsidian ladders, Carol doesn't like it. While the dupes are working on that over on Toxedo, I figured I'd give you a couple of other updates over here on Rikazon. Since we had some Paku here, we installed a fish feeder and now have a couple of tame Paku. I put doors here because I didn't want to feed the entire pond worth because I want them to stay wild. But now that they're tame, I can actually deconstruct the fish feeder and these doors, which gives us another check mark in Critter Whisperer. What we have left now is Shine Bug, Shovels, and a gassy moo. Solvos are going to be easy. We have plenty of them sitting on this planetoid. The gassy moos are going to take a little bit because we're not going to find them until we get over to Methaniel. And apparently I ruthlessly killed all the previous shine bugs over here on Toxedo. I can't find a single one of them. So we'll either have to find them from a planetoid or just wait until we get them from the printing pod. And after a few minutes, we have a beautiful vacuum here and what's going to eventually be our nice steam chamber. So I can get rid of all these things and I'm going to end up sweeping all of them up before it gets super hot in here, which is another. No, Eric, don't stand in there. Bad Eric, which is another consideration when you're doing projects like this. Don't ever sweep these materials. They are entirely too hot and occasionally the duplicate will drop them in places like this. And once again, bad things will happen. One of my next steps was actually getting a heavy watt wire to cross this entire area so that we can connect it into our steam turbines and our smart battery. Unfortunately, we're down to six tons worth of wolframite and don't have any other ores other than uranium ore. Or, well, we could start using steel because we're up to 18 tons of it already, but we're not going to do that. Instead, we're setting up a little delivery system here on Rikazon. We're going to have this storage bin. We're going to have the dupes load up any and all metal ores until we get 20 tons. We'll put it on a six to make sure the duplicates do it pretty quickly. And now that we have them all loaded up, I can just eject them from the storage bin and the auto sweeper is gonna continuously load them into the conveyor loader. Now, right now I had snipped off the refined metal, but all I really need to do in the future is let it do a 50-50 split. But because I want all those ores over there pretty quickly, I'm just gonna concentrate on shipping the metal ores first. Our diamond window tiles are going in and already they're sitting around 1450 degrees. So we're gonna have to be a little careful. Now because of the angle, we're actually gonna be able to get it to touch solid magma, which is gonna be great. And as the magma level drops, because we've drawn so much heat out of it, we'll be able to keep burrowing down and adding more window tiles. With the temperature spike in, we can now concentrate on the steam chamber itself. Now this can get a little dicey as well. And the way I'm going to be doing it is probably a little bit different than what you're used to. Colonel Sanders, you're supposed to watch out for the angry poke shells. Somebody come pick Colonel Sanders up. Seriously, nobody wants to come pick Colonel Sanders up? There we go. Get better soon, buddy. Like I was saying before Colonel Sanders decided that they were gonna be crab food, we need to be careful about the installation of these next steps. And it's for this reason, I don't actually use diamond to directly connect to the steam chamber. And the reason is pretty simple. The steel metal tiles have a thermal conductivity of 54 and a specific heat capacity of 0.49. 
the diamond window tiles have a higher specific heat capacity and almost double the thermal conductivity. In other words, they transfer temperature almost too quickly into this chamber. So there's a chance it would get too hot in here before all of our temperature controls kicked in. I was looking at the heavy watt wire and we already have about another three and a half tons of wolframite that's been delivered. But I was thinking, why not just use heavy watt conductive wire? We now have an infinite supply of gold, iron, and cobalt. So why wait on the ore? I mean, this is gonna work just as well. Granted, that just cost us half of our cobalt supplies, but it'll be okay. I suppose with the door open, even though these metal tiles are sitting at 1400 degrees, it's probably time to start dropping off some water. Now I'm gonna want a lot of steam pressure in this room. That way, the temperature fluctuations are not that severe when this door does try to inject some heat. And we are of course gonna need a thermo aqua tuner in order to be able to keep all these steam turbines nice and chill. So I think we're gonna put it right here. I'm also gonna have to put a bunch of temperature shift plates in here. And while Envarlin has done a great job dropping us off a lot more raw minerals, we still aren't doing that great with them. So I think in this case, we're gonna have to use granite. We're down to 268 tons, which I'm not excited about. And because this corridor is so thin, I'm gonna actually have to put a long strip of temperature shift plates down here. And since I'm doing it there, I might as well do it here as well. Just making sure that I avoid touching any edges because it doesn't make sense for you to inject temperature into abyssalite or into your insulated tiles. And you may have noticed that I only made this room three tiles high. And the reason why I did that is to ensure that this room was small enough to be considered a power plant. And it looks like we're gonna be able to get four steam turbines in here. And I'm gonna group them more here towards the left because that's where the majority of the heat source is. Of course, we'll need a smart battery. On the power plant, we're gonna allow it to use gold or cobalt. So mistakes might have been made. And I know what you're thinking. Echo, you're a professional gamer. What are you doing? Like it's a thousand degrees inside that steam room. Yeah, see, what had happened was I was working on our new rockets and the thermo sensor flipped because it was set to below seven degrees instead of above seven degrees, which caused the door to shut. So when they dropped off a little bit of water, well, now we have 800 degrees steam in here, which also caused all the temperature shift plates to melt because granite temperature shift plates can only go up to 668. Winning! So what I need to do is actually get one of these steam turbines on pretty quickly. And once everything was plugged in, it did not take long at all for the steam turbines to absolutely max out at 850 watts. That's gonna be improved shortly by use of the power control station. We just need to get it cooler in here so I can actually put the thermal aqua tuner in because it's not gonna take too long for these steam turbines to start overheating. Despite the fact that just a few cycles ago, it was pretty cold over here. We're waiting for some super coolant to be dropped off for this liquid pump, and we're gonna use it for the cooling loop, which will help make sure this thermo aqua tuner runs at the maximum amount of efficiency. It's back down to a respectable 125 degrees inside this room, so I can start the process of dropping off more water again. We put a large power transformer here instead of just biting off of stuff that was over here for the simple reason that we needed to be able to power the thermal aqua tuner, this emergency gas pump, and the door. And once again, Echo, the professional gamer, has struck because this is a liquid pipe element sensor and not a liquid pipe thermo sensor. I decided that I am going to put a temperature shift plate connected to these metal tiles, and that way the temperature gets transferred up into this thermo sensor as quickly as possible. But because these metal tiles are gonna get so hot so quickly, we're gonna use a diamond temperature shift plate and connect it here and here. Also realize I don't want one here. It would end up being very inefficient and in injecting temperature into this piece of abyssalite. With the correct sensor in, the thermo aqua tuner has already started running and the super coolant is sitting down at 18 degrees. Very nice. But this brings up a point of an emergency sensor and that is this thermo sensor here. And the reason why it's necessary is because we have a thermo aqua tuner in here. So while this door is gonna control when this door shuts, and in this case, we haven't really set that temperature yet, we're gonna have to play with it and see how long it takes the temperature to inject. This thermo sensor is gonna be allowed to turn these steam turbines on regardless if this smart battery is like, nah, we're good on power. The smart battery is set on 9040. So whenever the total power grid has less than 40% power available, it'll send a green signal to all the steam turbines and they'll turn on. But once again, because of this thermo aqua tuner and making sure that we don't destroy it, we're gonna have a sensor in here that says if it gets too hot, 
turn on the steam turbines anyways. Now that I think about it though, I think this thermo sensor would be better served being closer to the thermo aqua tuner that it's meant to protect. So I think this position right here will work out well. Once again, pro gamer. We've dropped off enough water to where we have 20 kilos worth of steam pressure in this room, which I'm pretty happy about. And take note that Dave and Lady Ruff are tuning up the steam turbines now. And when they're finished, each steam turbine is gonna be able to provide 1,275 watts for a total of over five kilowatts, which is absolutely wonderful. Now we just need to make sure that this entire room stays hot enough to do so. Because remember, the NG's tune-up will double the amount of wattage that each steam turbine is providing, but in order to get the 1,275 watts, we have to be much, much hotter in our steam. So I think we're gonna set this thermo sensor for now to say 200 degrees. So whenever it is below 200 degrees in this steam room, this door will shut, taking in temp from the window tiles and the metal steel tiles, inject them in, into the metal tiles, which are directly connected to these temperature shift plates, which will then transfer through the rest of the temperature shift plates. And once the thermo sensor detects that the steam around it is above 200 degrees, it opens the door, creating a vacuum, which stops the temperature flow. So we have this thermo sensor set on 200, and this one set on, I was gonna use 225, but I think 250 will probably do a little bit better. And now the steam turbines are absolutely crushing it. The current wattage coming out of this one steam turbine is the 1.275 kilowatts. And for now, the power grid looks like it's stabilized. The steam turbines have turned off because this smart battery has plenty of power, which ends up just keeping all this steam in here waiting to be absorbed by the steam turbine. So in essence, every tile worth of steam and these temperature shift plates become little thermal batteries. This is one of the reasons why I absolutely love geothermal power. It is so very efficient, decently easy to implement, and is gonna last our colony long, long after I stop playing the seed due to the efficiency of how we built it with all the temperature shift plates and the automation set on the smart battery. So during the time I had my head down building that geothermal power, some of you may have noticed the stress meter going up. Well, that's because I tried my hardest to strangle this colony using carbon dioxide. When we installed the four ethanol distillers, I knew they'd be creating more carbon dioxide. Not a big deal. Just more for our little slicksters to eat, except I'd accidentally made this critter drop off a long time ago, not out of steel. And it ended up overheating, and I deconstructed it with the intent of putting it back. Well, when I didn't, we weren't dropping off any more slicksters. So I made it just in time to realize, wait a minute, why is there so much carbon dioxide here? And it was because of the combined effects of the coal generators having to run constantly, the petroleum generator having to be run constantly, which made the ethanol distilleries have to also run constantly. But now that the ethanol buffer tank is full, these ethanol distillers won't be running as often, which means we won't be creating as much carbon dioxide. So the slicksters should be able to eat that down. Well, that and combined with our double carbon skimmer system. I mean, don't judge me. Don't act like you haven't done this before. You know it's a thing. As promised in the beginning of the episode, I told you we were going to build a few rockets. And while we're not quite using them yet, I figured I'd go over what each one's purpose was. For now, we're going to call them Rocket 1, 2, and 3. And they're tentatively named the Spirit of Ejected Mirror 6, Progress Apollo, and the Exploratory Mars 1. So you know what I'm going to do. I'm gonna ask you to go down in the comments and name all three rockets. And this time I'm challenging you to be a little bit more creative because there's three rockets that should have similar names. Maybe it's a theme. And am I asking you to name these rockets because it helps me out? Or am I asking you because every time you comment on the video, it actually helps the video out? Well, to be honest, both. The first rocket here is equipped with three large liquid fuel tanks, two liquid oxidizer tanks, a spacefarer module, and a power pack setup. This is gonna be our long range exploration rocket. And by looking at our wonderful rocket information sheet that you can also find over at the Oxygen Not Included Wiki, you can see that three fuel tanks is gonna give that rocket a range of 48 tiles. 48 tiles is gonna allow us to go to the edge of the star map and back without any difficulty. In fact, the other two rockets with only two large liquid fuel tanks are gonna be able to have a range of 32 tiles. So to highlight that, it means they're gonna be able to go to 16 tiles out and 16 tiles back. And the furthest Tuxedo is from the very edge of the map is 14 tiles. 
So even our rockets with less fuel are going to be able to get to any destination on the star map. The only difference is our exploration rocket is going to be able to fly out to say one point of the edge of the map, follow the edge of the map around, and then return. I'm not 100% sure how it's going to go when we finally launch these rockets because it's going to want to cook everything around here. And I'm thinking of a method of being able to capture all that heat by using a heat sink and then plugging it into even more steam turbines. It could be as something as simple as just building all this out of steel and then having a steel heat spike connected to a steam room with a couple of steam turbines doing their thing. Or is it even worth it to do that? I know some of you are going to say something like, well, if you want to collect power from the rockets, you really ought to put in a rocket chimney. To which I would reply, where? We don't exactly have much room for anything here. One last little update here on Rikazon. We are slowly building more and more steel bunker tiles as we get the steel. And unfortunately, it's been so long since I've been here on Rikazon. We're in the second meteor shower. The first meteor shower hit the bunker doors as planned, but then the bunker doors opened and dropped all this hot regolith here. And yeah, you can see that I'm putting up some dig commands, even though the meteors are still going. And that's because I finally put in a wonderful suit system for the dupes here on Rikazon. We even made sure to cover the entrance with some bunker tiles so we don't have to worry about any meteors ending up down here. But we will want to get up here and start digging some of this out too. We've gotten about halfway through the digging in this biome here, which means we're going to have all the ores and refined metal we ever need over here on our main planetoid. But with the construction of these three hydrogen rockets, the star map is our oyster, which means we can really start concentrating on knocking the rest of those achievements out. AKA, I'm really just out of excuses at this point. I know everybody's looking forward to chuckling in the comments below about the fact that the colony is half filled with carbon dioxide, but while you're down there, remember, we're also trying to name these three rockets. I'm looking forward to seeing what you come up with. As a reminder, if you're still enjoying this series, hit the like button as well. So until next time, much love, happy gaming, and I'll talk to you soon.